بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Right, we're experiencing, you know, you could you could say economic growth. Wealth is also at an all-time high, generally in in uh, in society. If you take debt out of the equation and deficits out of the equation, right, people have a lot more materially, and yet we're seeing this complete imbalance where maybe people in the past did not have that much money, but also, we're not reporting the levels of stress uh, nearly at the levels that we're seeing today. So, what is what is what's a what's what's his definition? What's a definition that we can start with for depression and for stress? Well, it's the opposite. You could you could start with one definition, which is just what is the opposite of right? Somebody who is stressed out is in a constantly moving state. You literally feel that when stress begins, you feel that con constant trepidation. That feeling of uh, not being able to control your circumstances, and so the worry begins and starts to bubble up. That is generally the opposite of a state of peace. Right? So you could define the opposite of that as just being in a calm, cool, peaceful state. Depression is the opposite of feeling happy. Right? And again, these are very just limited, basic definitions. Uh, we're not going to get into like deep mental health analysis here. That's not an area that I would feel... Uh, comfortable speaking on, uh, but just at a very general level, that would be a way we could define depression. Now, where does happiness and peace originate from? I would, you know, maybe somebody in the audience could uh, share where their what their thoughts are, so that we can make this a bit more inclusive. Anybody have? And again, you know, just whatever it comes from. Where does happiness and peace come from? Yes, please. Contentment. Okay, good. So it comes from. But where does the contentment come from? Remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah, right? Allah says in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min shaitan ar-rajim, ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'in al-qulub. That verily in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest. That it is in the dhikr of Allah that hearts are finding this sakina, this mutma'inna, this feeling of being calm and content. And stress, as we just defined, is the opposite of that feeling of being calm and content, right? So a form of peace then is rooted in dhikr. Now if you go one step beyond that, what is one of the definitions of Islam? Peace. There's another definition, submission, right? The Muslim, the active form of that is the one who submits. So you link then peace with submission. You can't really achieve true a true state of inner peace, a true state of being in a state of salam internally, in a state of being a true Muslim, again, in the reality of the word, and we're not talking about theology here, the reality of the word, if you do not have this element of submission. And so then the goal of our religion, one of the higher principles of this religion is peace. And it begins with internal peace. The Prophet ﷺ said, Afshu salam, spread peace. Right? And we take that as Muslims in one way where we say assalamu alaikum. But at the same time, that there's there's there are deeper meanings, right? With, when you're saying assalamu alaikum, you're saying may peace be upon you, may peace be with you. There's also an element of us trying to bring peace into our own life. And then when we do that, inshallah. Allah will allow peace to come in other people's lives through certain efforts that the human being might make. So the whole goal of this religion then is the state of peace, is the state of tranquility. It's the state of submission. And tranquility and submission come from, or sorry, peace again comes from submission. And submission is when the human being, how would somebody define submission? Assalamu alaikum, please come on in. How would somebody define submission uh, from a spiritual point of view? Yes. Accepting. Uh, so submission uh, was defined as accepting as what happened as the will of Allah. Alhamdulillah. Right? That's an excellent definition. That you and I don't have control. And so if we accept what's happening as the will of Allah, we will start to attain submission. So again, we just mentioned that Depression and stress are an all-time high. From a uh, definition point of view, 
depression and stress are the opposite of happiness and peace. Peace actually comes, and again, one of the meanings of the word, right, one of the meanings of our religion is peace. One of the meanings of the word Islam is peace, and then there's another meaning, submission. So peace is derived from this state of submission. And you just mentioned that submission is accepting that we are not in control, but rather that Allah is in control, and not trying to make that decision for ourselves. So is that, is that clear? Is that, does that make sense? Yes? Okay, alhamdulillah. So moving on then, where is this concept of submission? Where does it live? There is a place where it lives in the human being. Anybody want to take a guess? It's in the heart. Alhamdulillah. It's in the heart. It's in the heart. So submission for the Muslim lives in the heart. If you do not have a pure heart, you will not be able to attain the state of submission. Then you will be in a state of disarray, which again is one of the opposites of peace, right? And then you will have more and more stress, more and more issues, more and more depression, more and more worries in your life. The root then of all of this, according to our scholars, and this methodology generally is laid out by Imam al-Ghazali, Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam, Imam al-Ghazali, a scholar who lived in the 11th century. And he was an amazing scholar, if not one of the greatest scholars, if not the greatest scholar in the history of this religion. And it's laid out in his, uh, his famous book, the Ahya Ulum al din the revival of the religious sciences, of which many of the books, alhamdulillah, have been translated into English. And he specifically lays out this hierarchy in like book 20, 21, 22. He's talking about, and book one, he's talking about uh, what is going on, what is going on in this inner world of the human being. You have a lot of books that talk about what's going on in society. Imam al-Ghazali is talking about what's going on inside the inner world of the human being. And so one of the things that he says, as we just mentioned, is submission lives in the heart, that it is a reality in the heart. That if the heart can enter a state of submission, the whole, the human being then enters entirely into the state of submission. In the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu he said that in the human being is a piece of flesh. If it is sound, then the entire body is sound. And if it is corrupt, then the body is corrupt. And he said, verily it is the heart. So the heart is the focal point for us when we talk about stress and anxiety. And so the reason why you have such high levels, if you just you know, kind of keep with the flow that we're, that we're discussing, levels of stress, anxiety, depression, one of the core reasons is because the hearts are no longer in the state that they used to be in or in the state that they're supposed to be in. What is the heart created for? We know that the heart is created for the knowledge of Allah. Where Allah says in the Quran, one of the reasons, he gives a few reasons for why he created human beings. One of the reasons why Allah created human beings, he says in the Quran, that we did not create mankind and jinn except to worship me, except to worship Allah. And what does Ibn Abbas, the famous commentator in the, of the Quran, he says, that means, illa li yarifun, except to know me. That is the meaning of this specific statement. Not just ya'budun, but this true ubudiya comes from this experiential knowledge of Allah. And this knowledge of Allah then lives in the heart. So, what are the reasons then that the heart begins to get sick? So, you can talk about stress and uh, depression and anxiety if we understand the core reasons why the heart in and of itself is not well, because everything stacks on top. If the heart is good, everything that stacks on top is going to be good, inshallah. It's going to be completely good. But if it's not good, there's going to be problems here. And this doesn't matter, frankly, if you're a Muslim or a non-Muslim. I mean, every we're talking about everybody's hearts, right? A Muslim's heart is very susceptible to rust and to getting black. Otherwise, the Prophet ﷺ would not have mentioned that. Right? And so it's not that a Muslim is immune to these conditions of stress, anxiety, depression, all of these types of situations. So that being said, what are some of the ways that the heart gets unhealthy or what are the reasons that it gets unhealthy? Imam Ghazali, he mentions that there are four reasons, the four main nutrients that the heart needs in order to be healthy, in order to survive. And 
if it has these nutrients, again, we're talking about foundational building blocks. Think of these as the core vitamins, proteins, amino acids that the heart needs, right? Uh, that they're just like the as a metaphor that the human body needs in order to function, these will be what the heart needs in order to function. And then the rest stacks on top. The first is knowledge. Knowledge is important for the heart. Why? Because Allah says that he created the human being to know him. He, the first ayah that was revealed in the Quran, Iqra, recite, read, because this is a religion of knowledge. Our tradition is a tradition of knowledge. Allah taught Adam alayhi salam. What differentiated Adam alayhi salam from everybody else? Right? Well, that Allah says in the Quran that he taught Adam the names of all things. This is not talking about the names of like, oh, this, you know, your name is Shahriyar, your name is Ahmad, your name is Bilal. That's not what we're talking about. These are realities. Allah taught him the realities, the secrets of all things. When Allah is mentioning something that deep in the Quran, don't, don't think about it from our superficial, limited human understanding. Think about it from what's possible and what, what the Prophet ﷺ said about it, and what the ulama have said about it, right? It's, it's a very deep knowledge that Adam alayhi salam was given, of the realities of the secrets of the heavens and the earth. And Allah says in the Quran that he gave the human being the trust. He tried to give it to the mountains, he tried to give it to the earth, and they were just like, I'm not having it, no way, I can't handle it. No, no not for me. But the human being took it on. The human being said, I can handle this, right? And so if, and then Allah says in the Quran, وَلَكَدْ karamna Bani Adam, that we ennobled Bani Adam. He didn't just say we ennobled Muslims or we ennobled one religion. We, وَلَكَدْ karamna Bani Adam, that we ennobled Bani Adam. He ennobled Bani Adam. One of the ways he ennobled Bani Adam is this ability to get knowledge. That it is what differentiates you from an animal. Right? An animal eats, we eat. An animal drinks, we drink. An animal has relations, human beings are able to have relations. An animal can do all of the things. An animal is, and if anything, an animal is better at those things. Animals can eat more than us. Animals can do everything I just mentioned at more quantities than us. What differentiates us from the animals? Knowledge. So the first, this ability to know, this intellect, something that an animal would not be able to understand, right? So the first major nutrient that Imam Ghazali mentioned that the heart needs in order to be healthy and this is where, again, all of the stress and the depression and the anxiety, all of that builds on top of an unhealthy heart. If the heart is healthy, those problems can come, but they won't be come in the same way. They will very, you will very much have the framework for how to figure them out. But if the heart is unhealthy, then the problems really start to get deep and deep. So the first is knowledge. What type of knowledge is this? This is not information. This is not knowledge about just memorizing a bunch of things and then, no, that's not the type of knowledge he's talking about. He's, what he's talking about is what's called ilm tariq al akhirah that the knowledge of how to traverse the path of the hereafter. That is the knowledge that the heart needs. And if we just reflect on this, the reason why Imam al-Ghazali wrote his famous, one of many of the books that he wrote, but his famous book, Ahya al -Lumadin, was because at the time that he was living, all of the scholars of the time, most of the scholars of the time were focusing only on the outward knowledge, right? So they would, you, you had a bunch of people who knew a lot about all the rules of prayer, but like, why did we pray? What about the presence of prayer? What about khushu? The rules of fasting, but what about the secrets of fasting? What about the inner realities of fasting? What about the inner benefits of hunger, right? So he, what he did, what and what about you could be an alim, but you could have all these diseases of the heart. You could be arrogant. You could think that you're better than other people. That's very easy. That's very common amongst, uh, amongst as Imam Ghazali mentioned, amongst a category of scholars he describes in the Book of Knowledge. But if you had this ability to traverse the path of the hereafter, you didn't care about this dunya. And so you, were, you knew where you were going. So that's the type of knowledge the heart needs. Why does it need it? Because the heart knows when it gets sick. Like my heart, it very much knows I got this disease, I have this disease, this problem comes up. It knows it. Now it's up to me and it'll remind me, it'll, it's up to me whether I'm going to do something about it, right? Just like the body is going to tell you if you have a headache, you're going to know. If you have a fever, it's going to become clear that I'm not feeling well. The heart in the same way is going to tell you when it is not feeling well. And when it's not feeling well, it's certain diseases are starting to manifest in the heart. Example, again, envy, uh, love of the dunya, 
being greedy, being angry with people, always yelling at people, being arrogant. I mean, the diseases go on and on and on and on. So the heart, when it has these diseases, is going to be like there's a problem. So the type of knowledge he's discussing here is the knowledge that is actually farther than every human, be every Muslim to know this knowledge. It's farther than to know the knowledge, basic knowledge of the diseases of the heart and basic knowledge of how to purify them, right? Generally done in our tradition, it's tazkiyat, tazkiyat al-nafs, the sawuf, ihsan. Like th these are the 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 methodologies the ulama have come up with in order to figure out how to purify the heart. That's the knowledge we're discussing. So the heart needs knowledge, right? And then of course knowledge of how to pray, how to fast, how to make wudu. These are we, we these are given. You can't do anything if you ha don't have those basics down, right? Now one of the problems in our time is that we learn everything else. Like we'll learn this coding language, we'll learn C++, we'll learn, we'll study all of these things for the MCAT, we'll study all of these things, and I, that's all good. That's all good in its place. But then, and but and for ourselves and for our children, but then we don't know, like, okay, what's this, like, why am I feeling angry today? We can't figure that out. Why? And that's that, that means that we have misprioritized knowledge, that the knowledge we should be learning about first is what is going on in here. Because if you fix what's going on in here, Everything that's going on out there makes sense and everything that's going on out there becomes possible to fix. But it is impossible for a human being to fix what's going on out there if the inside is still a mess. And the inside is just a reflection, or sorry, the outside world is just a reflection of the inner world that we were discussing, right? And Imam Ghazali has a beautiful metaphors, we'll, we'll discuss those shortly. So the second one, so the knowledge is the first one. The second nutrient that the heart needs. And again, we're talking about why stress, depression, anxiety start, and it's because we're not in this state of submission. Submission lives in the heart, and the heart, if it's not healthy, won't be able to submit. So what does it need to be healthy? It needs to these four basic nutrients to begin with. So we acknowledge one. The second is worship, dhikr. That the heart, as we mentioned, we were created to worship Allah, and the heart needs, this is the, the, the essential vitamin that the heart needs in order to survive. That a heart that does not have dhikr is going to feel empty and you and I will feel it. Everybody has these low moments where we're just like, why am I here? What's going on? What's the point of all this? Like, I got everything. I got this, I got this car. I got this house. I got this job. I have a family. Alhamdulillah. Like you're just, but something is missing. And what's missing most of the time is that we are forgetting the purpose of why we were created. That all of these are just means. That's it. Right? That we don't let our, don't, Allah says in the Quran, don't let your wealth and your family distract you from the worship of Allah. And it's not, doesn't, that, that can be worship. It can be a vehicle, but it shouldn't be the end. Right? It can be a means for us to get closer to Allah. So worship and dhikr. What is this? This is, it starts with, the first form of this is us just establishing whatever form of worship we can do. Look, if you can't pray, like if your children, if, if this can be for when you're young, when you're old, whatever. If you're not feeling like you're just like, I don't want to pray. Okay. Just whatever you can do though. You can still talk to God. Like if you've ever had a moment in your life, like, yeah, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to pray. Okay. Inshallah, you'll get there. But just have a conversation with God. Like he'll still listen to your problems. Don't think that you're cursed because you didn't do something. Allah is way beyond that. His mercy is way beyond that. He's going to call you to him slowly, 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 inshallah. It doesn't mean you put the fist down, right? And most of the time, if that's happening with us or our children, it means that we missed one of these components because the desire for prayer should come as, as something inwardly. It shouldn't always come from the top down. If you can cultivate the right components inwardly, that desire is going to come in and of itself. So yes, you add the outward push, but even if you can't do that, even if you don't want to, we, you know, we miss Fajr, we miss this prayer, we miss that prayer, okay, whatever you can do. If you can do five istighfars a day, astaghfirullah, 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 okay, that's all I could do. The heart got something, at least you give it something, right? Just because you can't have an entire meal doesn't mean that you like don't drink any water. You do what you can do. And so this is really important. We have to put context into the situation that we're in, especially if you, you are dealing with or you yourself are feeling that you're in this state of being really disconnected. Like if anybody is feeling disconnected, that you can get connected again. Don't feel like you have to rush into everything. You don't have to rush into being the, the hajjud praying, all of these, doing all of your dhikr all at once. No, 
just slow and slow and slow, but just do something, right? We don't leave everything just because we can't do all of it. We just take whatever we can. So that's important. And then you build on top. So once you get that, okay, I'm going to add one prayer a day. Again, because worship will fix the heart. It's just going to start to happen. You will start to see the realities because every time you're worshiping, lights are entering the body. There's the, there's the seen world and there's the unseen world. And the first few ayahs of the Quran talk about those who believe in the ghaib, right? That those who have a yaqeen in the ghaib, in the unseen. So what's happening in the unseen, leave that to God, but know that it's happening. He's putting lights, he's putting sakina, he's putting all of these things inside of you when you're submitting to him and praying to him. And that's what's calming down all of the negative forces that are also coming into us from shaitan, from what we see, from all the music that we listen to, from all the things that we watch, from just being in society, from all the words that we say that we shouldn't say. All of those create darknesses in the heart and Allah creates light in the heart. And prayer and dhikr create light and everything else creates darkness. That, or not everything else, but you know what I mean. The, this category creates darkness. So to start the conversation about removing the stress and the anxiety, first the light has to be there more than the darkness. It has to push it out because the darkness is what creates this constant movement, trepidation, worry, and this, this state of a heart that is not in a state of peace. Then what do you do? It doesn't just stop with your fara'id. Right? That's alhamdulillah. That's amazing. If you can do your fara'id, then you add on the next layer. Because the heart needs more and more dhikr. It needs as much as possible. So then you add on the next layer. What is the next layer? The du'as of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? The Prophet ﷺ would do du'as and prayers in the morning time, prayers in the evening time. So you do add on those du'as if you can. Right? And there's different compilations of these. For example, the Wird al Latif of Imam Haddad, a famous compilation. Seven, ten minutes to do, but it's a it's all of the du'as that you need for the morning time and for, for you have a good for you to have a beneficial day in alignment with the sunnah of the Prophet. That those are the du'as that are taken from his sunnah. Right? And then there's other sunnah dhikrs the Prophet would do regularly. He encourages us to do Yasin, Surah Waqiyah, and Surah Mulk. The Muslims should, if they're getting again the building blocks, you got the prayers down, you have the other adkar down that we just mentioned add on these, the Quranic dhikrs, right? Yasin, Mulk, and Waqiyah should be staples for, for Muslims. That's, that's was, that was a staple, that was the staple diet for the Muslims generally, a staple spiritual diet. Our grandmothers, they always do that. In Pakistan, they have certain books that, you know, that Manzil and whatnot, that, 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 that have these adhkar already laid out, right? So these are the standard adhkar that if you can get, if you can just build on top, build on top, build on top. And again, the goal is not just to recite. The goal is to achieve this state of peace and tranquility and your stress, your problems, you're always comparing yourself to people on Instagram and worrying about what they're doing and thinking about what's going on in their life and why it's not going on in your life and why is this person in this situation and what does this Facebook status say and why does he have more likes than me and why does she get more likes than me and why does th this person get more attention? All of those problems will just, without you even having to worry too much about it, slowly disappear because the thicker brings the light and with the light, the darkness goes away. Light and darkness cannot exist in the same area. And these are all darknesses that exist that create this situation. So again, we had knowledge, and with knowledge we mentioned, and these are the nutrients that the heart needs. Knowledge was the, the basic fara'id that we should know, right, of how to do our acts of ibadah, of knowing who Allah is, knowing who Allah isn't, right? Aqidah, fiqh, aqidah, and the science of how to purify the heart. If we can learn these three knowledges, the heart has now the basic nutrients to start building more. Then we make sure that we have our worship is good. Our basic worship, we're doing whatever acts of worship we can do. Even if we can't pray and we don't feel like it, we just have a conversation with God. We just do something, you know? And then we add on more and more on top of that, inshallah, as we just mentioned. The sunnah dhikrs, the Quranic dhikrs. So these are the two, the, 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 the first two. The third is something that comes as a result of these two, which is love of Allah. And it's interesting that Mama Ghazali mentions this as a trait for the heart to be pure and for the heart to be uh, sound. Because love is a concept, it's something that's not really tangible. Like you can read, you know, you can read Surah Yasin and you're like, yeah, I got that down. Or you can pray Fajr, but like what does that mean to love Allah? Well, that's the whole thing, is that the heart is more than just formula. There's, a, there's, there's something deeper there. This is your love relationship with Allah. 
that the whole reason Allah created you, the entire reason that Allah created you was that He loves you and He wants to show you how much He loves you. That is, you can generally sum that up. And He wants you to eventually come back to Him in this state knowing how much He loves you and being able to show that. Right? And sometimes He shows that with favors. Other times, you know, you're doing something wrong and there's a little bit of, no, no, don't do that, don't do that. It's not good for you. It, but it's all out of love and it's all out of mercy. And Allah mentions love in the Quran so many times. Allah who yuhibba tawabin. Allah who yuhibba mutatahirin. Allah who yuhibba sabirin. Like all these, you can go on for the different types of people that Allah loves. Allah has a general love for, for people who are trying to get closer to Him and just for His creation in general, especially then for people who are trying to get closer to Him. So then, what is this love of Allah? This is a deeper relationship. Now you're trying to get into the state of having an intimate relationship with Allah. That one of the higher stations in this religion is love and intimacy. Where that comes from realizing, the, what, one of the ways it comes is from realizing the bounties that Allah has bestowed upon you, number one. Number two, it comes from spending alone time with Allah. That if you love somebody, everybody, right, if you have an intimate relationship with somebody, you want to hang out with them, just you and them, right? You have that time together. It's no different with Allah. What is the wisdom behind the tahajjud prayer? That that was the time the Prophet ﷺ would just spend, he would spend like not just two minutes, five minutes, we're talking three, four hours a night, every night. That was just him and Allah. Just that was the, it was between, that was between them two, right? And that love, that's what keeps you going. It's what puts the, it's, 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 it's what makes this religion uh, actually interesting. Right? Otherwise, it becomes dry really quickly. And this happens where you're just like, man, I feel like I'm doing it. I'm just not feeling anything. I just feel so dry. I don't know. I'm just like, oh, Allah, like, you just like quickly go through your emotions and you're just like, okay, yeah, I'm done. So I'm like, okay, back to my conversation. When you love somebody, it's not like that. You're like, okay, let me just, let me like make sure I'm ready to talk to you. Let's like go out on a nice date. You know, you're like, that's what you want to do. And so in the same way with Allah, when you love him, you're like, okay, now that the time is here, I can actually have a conversation with my Lord. That love is a crucial trait. And it's going to be very difficult to fix these problems of stress, anxiety, depression. If first and foremost, the one who is in the elder one is not manifesting that state of love because it won't then transition to the younger generations, whether that's a parent or anybody else. That love has to be there. And if you and I don't make that a priority, we cannot expect it to just somehow magically appear in anybody else. We have to make it a priority. Absolutely. Just for, even if like, you're like, okay, like, yeah, I just do whatever I can do, but I'm not really into this whole religion thing. But you're seeing your kids getting into states of stress, anxiety, depression, worries, and all of these other things that we're not going to discuss in today's topic, but we've discussed in past topics of, you know, getting into drugs, smoking, hooking up, relationships, partying, all the things that happen, you have no, we, we have no idea how commonplace it is in our Muslim community, let alone just in high schools, right? And if just for that sake alone, we should make this a priority, let alone, of course, for our own akhirat. I mean, that's the, obviously the, the most obvious uh, answer. But if we can't do it for that situation, especially if you've been, you know, like in the state of just like, yeah, I, I, don't, I just got to go to Jummah and do what I got to do and that's it, I'll be okay. Okay, that, that's not the way that the Prophet explained it to us. But if that's all we can do, okay, alhamdulillah, we try to do a little bit more just for the sake of making sure that love goes beyond our generation and goes on to the next generation. So those are the three. And then the fourth is actually knowing how to apply this. And this is where Imam Ghazali says wisdom. It is one of the major traits that the heart needs. Because you can have all of the other ones, but if you don't know what to apply at what time, you won't be able to figure this out. Wisdom is very important. And that's knowing what piece of knowledge to apply when. I'll give you an example. If somebody just entered the fold of Islam, somebody just entered Islam, let's say that like they have certain elements. Okay, like let's say somebody has like tattoos everywhere. Okay, okay. In the Sharia, if if you were to look at from the from the law point of view, yes, that's not something that's permissible. They just entered the religion, and it's really expensive, and it hurts a lot to get rid of those. Are you? And now that someone is like, "Oh, Allah, brother, what are you doing? You're entering the masjid." Like people do that type of stuff. So you have no wisdom or common sense 
or diplom diplomacy. You just don't know what you're doing. So you can have all the knowledge. Don't you know in this book it says this, this, and this? But you didn't have the wisdom for how to apply the knowledge. Now that brother is like, dude, this is how, like, come on, man. Like, I'm just trying to figure this whole thing out. And you're going to treat me like that? And that may, maybe you drive them away. And that's on you because you didn't know what to say. So it's better just keep our mouths shut most of the time. Don't tell people how to pray. You see somebody praying differently, I guarantee you there's an opinion out there that says they could pray that way. Why? Because this religion has multiple madahib, multiple rulings. Everybody's not the same madhab, right? The different, so, so know what to apply. And if you, if we're in the category of just, we, we, we try to worship Allah and we do that, don't elevate ourselves to the category of being an alim or being an alim who is able to give fatwa and rulings and what. No, okay, just, this, this, this is also commonplace. You see this a lot where people will try to tell other people, don't you know, you can't pray like this. That's the mashur of the Maliki Madhab. You can pray like that. It's completely, completely okay. You're going to question Imam Malik? No. Or his school? No. Like, just let people do what they need to do. Don't be the policer, the police force in this instance. Unless you have the wisdom, then you'll pull someone aside and be like, hey, I noticed you're doing something. Is everything okay? Like, is that, I don't know if that's something really that's appropriate. And then they're like, actually, no. Like, this is the situation I'm going through. They're like, oh, okay, alhamdulillah. You know, that, that's the wisdom of how to apply that knowledge. That's really important. Because if the heart doesn't have that, it starts to get into corrupt states. Because it can have the other three and then start to think, look at me. I do all this Quran and I know all these things and all this stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, that's fine. But that's not going to benefit you if you're thinking that about yourself. So these are the four, and sorry, I digressed a little bit. But these are the four nutrients that the heart needs. Then the whole purpose of what, that, so that's what the heart needs. From there, it's about why or one of, what are the reasons that we're here. We're here, again, for three main reasons. One is to ilm, to learn. Two is suluk, to traverse this path of traveling towards Allah, right? This path of knowing how to get from where I am right now and to eventually get to this state where I'm near to Allah. And the third is service, serving other people, doing dawah, calling other people, whatever form of service we can do, just service. Ilm, suluk, and service. These are the principal reasons that will cure the heart of its problems if we spend our time doing these three. And everything builds on top of that, like our jobs, all this, of course, is all on top of that, right? But these are all forms that if you are grounded in knowledge, you have the right intention, everything you do can be worship. Your job is a fard because you have to bring in money to support your family. You're in, you know the knowledge of how to work, what's halal, what's not halal. It all comes, starts to come into perspective, right? So these are the reasons, again, uh, the ilm, suluk, and service, knowledge, devotion, and service are the reasons that will help give us the life that it is that we're seeking in order to start building on top to remove this stress. Now, I'm going to get on this uh, whiteboard here. Is there a marker somewhere here? Oh, right here? Uh, okay, so, oh yeah, no, marker, I got it. Thank you. Yeah, so... Um, now, one thing that's, I'm going to pause here. Anybody have any questions up till this point? Yes. Should I say it again? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I was asking, how can we differentiate the love of Allah and simply the fear of Allah and the fear of doing the wrong thing and our motivation to do good deeds for the ahira. How can yeah. we differentiate that? So you need, um, the Prophet said that the believer, they, ha has, they have fear and they have hope. And they're in balance. So you do need fear and you do need hope. Love is a higher station though than both. So when you do things, like I'll give you an example. If you tell your, your child, like, you know, uh, if, you, if you don't wash the dishes, I'm like, you know, I'm going to ground you for, um, for two days, whatever it is, right? And they're like, just, oh, okay, I've got to wash the dishes, otherwise mom's going to get mad at me. Like, ah, I'm going to do it, right? And they're scared of mom or scared of dad. So they'll do that. And that's good. You'll still be like, okay, they did what I asked them to do. Alhamdulillah. Without you really even mentioning much of them, they just know that you like the dishes done. And one day you come, like, mom, I love you so much. I cleaned the whole house for you. Which one would you like more? Second one. <laughs> and just... And then they come and they tell you, I love you so much. Thank you for everything you've done for me. I just thought I'd do a little. And their cleaning the house has 
still can never repay all of the things that you did for them, that you took care of them, that you nurtured them, that you carried them for nine months. It can't repay it, but you're still gonna, you're gonna feel great, right? Similarly, when we're trying to worship Allah out of love, it is a very high station that we're just trying to like, I don't, it doesn't really matter to me whether I'm gonna get to this heaven or, or wherever else. Like, I just, I love you. Like, you did everything. Look at everything that you gave me. Every, you created me, you're my Lord. You created me to worship you. I'm gonna fulfill my purpose by doing that. So that's, it's not necessarily that it's contradictory. It builds on top that if you don't have the fear, you won't be able to get to that, that, that station. And generally in, in our tradition, you alternate between states where you'll have this state of intimacy and then you'll have the state of awe, of just khashia, right? And you will go through alternations on the spiritual path of these type of states. Um, but the love, doing things out of love is something that we should all want to do. That it's not like, oh, because God told me I have to do it. It's like, I want to do this. And when the heart gets more and more pure, that desire comes more and more. Like why, it's not far to stand for 20 rakat in taraweeh. Now, it's Sunnah Muakkadah, it's highly emphasized Sunnah, so we should do it. But it's not like, it's, you're not going to be uh, sinful individually if you leave that just for yourself, according to uh, some of the opinions. So in that state, why do we do it? It's out of this, like, I want to get closer to God. And that's out of, generally, it's out of that love. And we might not recognize it, but there's a part in us that's, that is hoping for that. And that's where that love, we have to feed it, and then it'll come out more and more, and it'll manifest more and more. Does that make sense? That's a good example. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll continue, and then we'll get, we'll get uh, to the questions uh, after this next section, if that's okay. So what happens over time? Human beings, we all have a, so we all have, a heart, as we mentioned, right? Can you guys still hear me if I talk like this? Okay. So, what does uh, what's possible if you were to just say, okay, this is this is the heart. My not so good drawing. All right. So, inside of every human being, you have this. Now, has anybody ever felt like a um, like a void that they just need to fill with something? They're just like. Oh, like I'm feeling off, like if I just, I just, I just did this one thing, if I, I'm just feeling like this emptiness, it could be existential or it could be in a moment. I know I have. And that void accumulates over time. That void is very, very common in our society, especially when people don't have Allah in their life or God in their life. This void is constantly coming. Now, what happens? We start to fill this void with whatever we can. So we'll try to fill it with money. And that's what, and whatever enters the heart, Whatever we try to fill the void with is what enters the heart. We'll try to fill it with like relationships with other people. I'm not going to try to draw people because I'm not going to be good at that. Right? We'll try to fill it with anything. We'll try to fill it with Facebook. We'll try to fill it with Instagram. We'll try to fill it with, with cars. Right? We'll try to fill it with houses. We'll try to fill it with status. Oh, I'm a VP of product. Oh, look at me. Oh, yeah. People love that stuff. They love their titles. No, you're a human being. That's like you are just like every other human being. But your title, it's, it's, it's for you, but it doesn't matter. Don't fill your heart with that. That's not the goal of life, to be in a CEO or to be in this status. Or, but we'll start to fill it. Now, it starts with, generally, the levels it goes to. We have food. These are the levels of desire, according to Mama Ghazali. Sex, food, sex, uh, wealth, fame, power. Most human beings are trying to do one of these. Just either spill all of our time like I'm a foodie, like I just got to worry about food, right? And that's good if you enjoy taste, alhamdulillah, you just sugar and eat, that's great. But that's not the purpose of your life, to just spend all of our time always looking at food. Okay, and then obviously, like we know this is very common in our society where everybody just, if you, you don't feel like I, you want to settle down with one person, like have one partner, people are just constantly seeking more and more relationships and more and more opportunities to fulfill the sexual desire. It goes on from there, and it's like, well, I got that down. Now I just want a bunch of money. I want to become, what did they say, rich and famous. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. Like, you should not want that. No. Why, right? Because they're, 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 they're also spiritually poor and depressed, most of them. So it's not rich and famous, right? But it goes to the wealth and then fame. I got enough wealth. Now what can I do? I want influence. I want power. I, I, want, I, want to be in, I want people to like, I want them to like me, like everything I post, and then it goes to power. 
this is generally the, 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 the flow of most politicians too. As you can see, those who are in office today, they generally follow this trajectory. And they have a checkbox on all five of these at very high levels. So completely forgot why you're, cre I mean, no sense of why you're creative, that you create, you're created for all these things. Then you fill the heart with it. Now what happens, Allah says in the Quran, have you seen the one who takes his hawa as his Lord? Hawa is desire. So these are the desire, these are the, the different forms of desire for the human being, right? And if you take all of these as your Lord, and we just mentioned, what was the heart created to do? To worship Allah and to have the love of Allah. Then you completely blacken the heart out. And the more and more the heart gets black, the more and more problems start to come in. And this can be major, like we, these are major categories, but it can be very subtle. If you're constantly thinking about the warriors and which, oh, what's Steph Curry doing today and what's Durant doing now and this situation and that situation, that will be the desire that dominates you. If you're constantly thinking about uh, Beyonce, like she's always playing in your head, that's your hawa, and that, that's your lord. Have you seen the one who takes his hawa as his lord? If you're constantly listening, right, to Tupac, that's, that's your, and that's always what's in your head, that you know his words better than the words of Allah and his messenger. And look, you know, we live in society, this stuff happens, it's not like a judgment call, it just, it happens. But point being that that is what our desire becomes. That's what our Lord becomes in this instance, and that's what fills the heart. If you're constantly thinking about what are other people going to think about me? If when I post this photo, is anybody going to like it? And when every time someone likes it, you get a little like, ooh, look at that. Okay, that, that's other people. You, this is, you, you, you're worshiping other people in that moment. It's very subtle. That's why these, it's not easy to get rid of these issues, but it is possible if we just understand what's going on and what the dynamics are, right? And so if we're worried constantly about other people, what are they going to think? Oh, he makes more money than me. He, drive, he used to drive, you know, a Toyota. Now he drives a Tesla. Man, I got to get that too. Otherwise, what's he going to say? What are they going to say when I go out to their house? What are they going to, like, you know, aren't they going to, you know, he got the, the P100D and I only got the P75 or 85D Tesla. Like, what, what, like who cares, man? If you want to get a nice car, get a nice car and be grateful to Allah. But like, don't worry about what other people think. It's so petty. Every time you do that, you're literally making sajda to that person. That's what's going on in your heart. The heart is can make sajda, but it's supposed to make sajda to Allah. You're making little, little mini random people in your community and you're just bowing down to them all the time. And that's very common, very common in our day and age. It's not a good thing though. Right? Or we bow down to Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, or we're bowing down to now he owns Instagram too. We're bowing down to all these people. You just want to spend all your time bowing down to these rich white guys? If that's what we do, or Netflix is CEO, because we just want to watch, that is what the heart is going, that's what's going to happen to the heart. The more and more we try to fill this void with other things. The only thing that can fill the void, and again, this can be more, right? We can, we can put drugs in here, right? Like a lot of people will just smoke their problems away or smoke, smoke enough weed to get their problems out, right? They'll, they'll drink enough. Right? They'll try to have relationships. Whatever it is, I guarantee you that if you are in high school or if your child is in high school and they're starting to get to that age where they feel like they want to have a relationship and they might even be, you know, have a girlfriend or have a boyfriend, most of the time it's because the void isn't filled with something else, with some either attention from parents, with some internal spring that's not present. Right? Because that des the desire for that is a very basic desire. You can get rid of that desire by bringing forth a greater desire. The highest desire, and, and it's not lower than these, it's the highest one, is knowledge. And this is knowledge of Allah. We're not talking about information here. The human being who goes on a path of knowledge, and I believe it's a hadith, Prophet Prophet said that two people will never be quenched. The seeker of knowledge and the seeker of wealth. And he said that if the human being were given one valley of gold, where's the other one? I got, I got one IPO, I want the next one. Like that's just the human being is just always thinking, how do I get more and more? But that can be in a good way, knowledge, right? Where we, we alhamdulillah have scholars in our tradition today who like, that's just their life. They want to they learn and implement and apply, alhamdulillah. So these are some of the different uh, voids that we have. Now, what did Allah say? We just explained that knowledge of Allah and love of Allah can literally erase all of these. That if you get that in your heart, the love of Allah, all of these slowly start to erase. And dhikr, a little bit of dhikr, just like, alhamdulillah, with this eraser, that's what dhikr will do. It'll just polish, polish, polish. Then we'll accumulate more and more and more. Polish. That's what dhikr does. 
Imagine that's what's happening to your heart every time, barely in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. Every time you do dhikr, all this is happening. But it can get to a point where, and obviously this is just the, you know, but Allah is what's dominating your heart. Allah and His Messenger. That's what's dominating the heart of the Muslim. And when that's dominating the heart of the Muslim, all of these other problems start to become much, you can put them into perspective. Because we're relying on Allah at that point, right? We're relying on the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ at that point. We're not relying only on ourselves or on how much money you're in the bank or how famous we are. Try becoming famous. Like half these famous people, the next day some controversy happens, boom, completely down, everybody hates them. The next day they do something again, everybody like, the people are going to let you down, but God is not going to let you down. So that's the void then that needs to be filled. Uh, the Prophet also said that the only thing that will fill the son of Adam is the dirt in his grave. That if, if he won't be satisfied until that fills him inside. So we can either do two, we have two choices. We either take this path of focusing on our desires, accumulating stress, anxiety, worry, but maybe we get a few likes here and there and some money and, you know, a Tesla, and that's all we focus on in life. And then we do all that, and then we get to the grave, all that stuff stops mattering, and then the dirt of the grave is what fills us. And then other problems, we ask Allah for protection, other problems can potentially come as a result. Or we focus our life on this goal and clearing all this nonsense out of the heart and letting Allah fill the heart. And when that happens, everything else can come too. Everything good can come. All hair can come, but the perspective is correct. So what are the, the, the practical steps then that, that we can start uh, taking? The first is when this emptiness is coming, the first is just really recognize what is the void that you have and what is the root cause of that void? Like, is it something that happened when you were a kid? with your parents, right? Like, did, did something happen where you just felt like that relationship was never resolved? Is it something that's between you and your, you might be a kid right now and it's between you and your parents? Is it something between you and your siblings? Is it between you and your spouse? Is it between you and other, like what, is, where is that void coming from? And that's just the human problems. And then we examine within ourselves, right? What are, excuse me, what are the different reasons why we may be feeling empty? And if we just use this framework, this framework, alhamdulillah, has been immensely beneficial to me. I'll think, like, man, like, I just, I didn't learn anything all week. Like, no wonder I'm feeling down. Like, and there's an immediate effect. If I just spend, like, five minutes listening to something, I'll be like, okay, at least I learned something. Because I know my heart needs that nutrient. Even if I don't apply it right now, even if it just sits somewhere, at least you got that nutrient. Because we said knowledge, worship, love of Allah, and wisdom, and how to apply all of those is what the heart needs. So... We then identify, what am I doing? What do I fill my time with? When I'm feeling down, do I go order some pizza and start watching Game of Thrones? And you know, okay, alhamdulillah, that's better than going and you know, buying a, a sack of weed and starting to smoke. And even if you're doing that, it's all good. You can still come back to Allah. But the point being that what are we doing with our time in these, in these instances? And what are we filling? What is the void that we have? And what are we filling it with? If that's how we're feeling it, then we just have to consider, okay, maybe, maybe I'll do that one day a month, and then the next time I'll just try. Even though it might be really hard, I'm just going to try to turn to God. I'm going to be like, okay, I'll get the pizza and not watch Game of Thrones, and I'll watch something else. Like, or I'll watch, you know, I'll try to get closer to Allah after I eat the pizza. You do slow baby steps, but you identify what is the void and what are you filling it with. If every time you're feeling down, you go on Facebook, and you think, maybe if I just look at how many people like my photos, I'll feel better. And this is a reality, and it happens. It's okay. But then we just say, okay, what can I do differently? Like, maybe deactivating is not the answer for you. Maybe that'll just be too extreme of a push. But okay, maybe the next time you're about to do that, you say, no, I'm just going to say, alhamdulillah, astaghfirullah, and just turn to Allah. And you don't have to do the specific dhikrs in Arabic, by the way. Like, just talk to Allah from your heart. That's, what, that's how love is cultivated, the intimate conversation between you and Allah the whole reason why we do all of these adhkar are to help us cultivate the knowing how to ask him. And then you ask him whatever language you want. English, Urdu, Spanish, sign language. You can ask God knows. Or just, just don't even talk and just let him read what's going on inside. And that, All that's possible with him. But that's important, right? To be able to have some sense of knowing why this is happening. Once we know and we identify why this is happening, then we say, and I'll, I'll give an example. Like, let's say I have a problem. 
let's say I'm feeling a void and I try to fill it with work. This is very normal, especially in Silicon Valley. People try to fill their voids with work and with status. So they'll say, okay, well, if I could just do this, then I'll become a director. And then I'll be happy. And then not happy. And then like, now if I just do this, I'll become a VP. And then I'll be happy. I may have spent all this time neglecting all these responsibilities that are more important, but I'll be a VP. Okay, but you're still not happy. What's going on? Well, no, it's really the SVP. That's the, if I can just get SVP, I'll be happy. Okay, no, you get that? No, something's wrong. What's going on? We'll try to fill that void with whatever we can. And look, this is the human reality. It's okay, but it's just taking a step back. And it's still good to do all those things. We need Muslims in high positions, but that's not, they should not be seeking that position. They should be seeking Allah, and he puts them in that position, alhamdulillah. But if you're seeking that, and that is your sole goal, that's not going to create health for the heart. That's going to create trouble for the heart, right? And so that's important to keep in mind. So we identify that void. Let's say that's me. Let's say I, I'm seeking more positions. I want to get promoted, and that's my goal. And that's what's filling my void. I could just, I just spend all my time. Now I have to examine, okay, what's missing in my life? Then I examine that framework of what we just mentioned. Knowledge, worship of Allah, love of Allah, right? And serving his creation and wisdom. We mentioned a few different ones. Then I examine, okay, if I'm not doing any, if I'm not spending any time learning, and we live in this society where it's like, oh, you go and get a bachelor's degree, and you go and you get a master's maybe, and then like you just spend the rest of your time after you come home from work in front of CNN or ARY or GOTV and just listening to what's going on in the news and not spend any time learning. And the heart needs to learn, so then the problems start then. If we know more about specific political situations and we don't know what's going on in our own reality, there's a problem. We take a step back, and then we identify, okay, how do I work on this? And so that's where the knowledge comes in, right? Then we say, okay, how much time am I spending doing dhikr? Okay, maybe I prayed today. I pray one prayer, or two, or three. Maybe I prayed all five, alhamdulillah, but was I really focused? No. Did I have one conversation with Allah? Maybe the prayer, we weren't able to have a conversation, and you just go sit in a room by yourself and just talk to God. And it can literally be as basic, because this is how the love and the worship is cultivated. As basic as like, hey God, how's it going? I'm good. Today I did this. I need your help here. Could you please help me out? Like just very basic conversation. But it starts the path. And that's how what we should be encouraging, especially our kids. That's how we should start encouraging them. Right? Just have that conversation with Allah. That you can memorize the du'as and everything is very important. But you should have a reason for why you're doing that. It should not be rote memorization without having any sense of what we're doing or the purpose of it. Then we create, so we said, right, first identify why we're feeling empty. So I said, okay, I'm just feeling empty because I'm not getting what I need and I'm not spending my time uh, uh, in the activities I should be engaged in. Maybe it's my environment. Maybe it's the people I hang out with. Maybe it's societal influences. Maybe it's just something that happened to me growing up. I don't know, but I'm feeling empty. Then I identify what am I using to fill the void. And for me, I said, okay, maybe I'm using my job. I just want to get promoted. I want to get this. I want to get that. Okay, and it'll be different for everybody. Then you identify what's missing in your life. Okay, I'm not learning enough. I'm not spending any time doing dhikr. I'm not spending any time really having intimate dialogue with Allah. I'm not spending any time serving anybody. Okay, so I'm missing all four. Maybe I'm missing one. Then you start to bring slowly. Then you create a plan. And now this is important. A methodical plan to bring these into your life and to the lives of your children and your family. That if we can't do, doesn't mean go and read five books a day. Okay, just one book every three months. One book a quarter, right? One book a year. Whatever we can do, just learn a little bit though, right? If you haven't picked up the Quran in a while, Pick up an English translation or whatever language you read, Urdu, Arabic, whatever it is, and just read. Try to understand what's going on. Read it with tafsir, with commentary, ideally, so you can understand what specific things mean because that's important. It gives you the context, right? And then we spend our time or with our family. Like one thing that's very, I've seen a lot of people do that's very uh, good trait is, okay, at one prayer you pray in Jamaat together, maybe Maghrib. And then you, you, you just read like a hadith book, like Riyadh al-Salihin, read one, two hadith. Maybe you talk about it for a little bit, and then that's it, go and eat dinner. But something, just a little bit, will go a long way in our time. That's the secret of the time we live in. Alhamdulillah, actually, for the time we live in. Because you can do one, one millionth of what people and what the Salaf used to do and attain amazing stations. 
because nobody's doing it anymore. And Allah has all these bounties to distribute still. And so the people doing dhikr are getting those bounties. But guess what? There's not that many people doing dhikr. So you can just grab them even if you just do a little bit. And then we create a plan for how are we going to spend more time with Allah, right? How are we going to create this ability to love Allah? And this is where, we, okay, we have a portion of alone time. Ideally, we can get up 5, 10, 15 minutes before Fajr, or maybe Fajr is the alone time, whatever it is that we can do. Or at nighttime, now Isha comes in early. So right before bed, five minutes, okay, I'm going to go, I'm just going to go be in a room alone and just, you don't have to pray, just go talk to God You already, if you already did your prayers, right? But whatever you can do or pray, whatever that alone time cultivates, but it's important to have that solitude. Solitude, Imam Ghazali describes in, in, in his book on character and disciplining the soul is one of the main ways to get the heart to be uh, alive again. It's one of the main uh, again, vitamins that the heart needs. And then what else can we do? Beg Allah for help in this time. And don't ever think that somebody, especially your own children or your own family, is not going through these problems. I guarantee you, you would be surprised how many of us in this room right now are probably like have had major spouts of depression. I know I have. I've definitely had those moments where I'm just like, what, what, what is all this? Like, what am I here for? What am I doing? Why am I feeling so down? Hey, those things will happen to the human being. And it's okay. The Prophet ﷺ, there's a whole year in Sirah called the year of sadness. The, all these sad events happen to the beloved ﷺ. It's okay to have those moments of sadness. But how do we respond? His way of responding was very different than the way that we're taught to respond in this day and age, right? Which is like, oh, smoke this, drink that, watch this, fill the heart with this. So that's really important. So if we do those four that I just mentioned, and then we finally complement it with begging Allah for help, we will be, inshallah, in a better place, and so will our children. That because Allah says He does not change the condition of a people until they change what's what until they change what's in themselves, right? That your condition will begin to change when you put in the hard work. And the beauty of it is, is you just have to take the first step. That just the fact that Allah wants us to even discuss this today and benefit from each other, inshallah, is a great sign of divine solicitude and that Allah wants immense khair for us and immense good for us. And so all of these problems, inshallah, can be solved. I'm going to move on to the second component of this that I mentioned, really getting diving into anxiety, but I wanted to pause for questions. If anybody has questions, comments, thoughts, anything to add, concerns, complaints. Yes, bismillah. You said that like attention that like celebrity gets is um is not something that we should want. But didn't Allah one of his hadith said um that I created mankind to be known, right? I was a hidden treasure to be known. So isn't what we're doing like trying to like um be famous or like be known the same thing as like um what Allah does or like what um Imam Hussein did in order to like keep this um like name going, you know, what is the difference? That's a really good question. That's a really good question. So the question was that if, and, and you mentioned the hadith, the hadith could see that Allah says, I was a hidden treasure and I, I, I created this creation to be known, right? For, for me to be known, for Allah in this instance to be known. Um, and so how do we think about this, especially when it comes to being famous and fame and everything? It's a good question. So the first is with Allah, the desire for Allah to be known, that's the process that we just described. That Allah wants us, and the best gift that Allah can give, and we should ask Allah for this regularly, is ma'rifah. Is give us the gift, ya Allah, of ma'rifah, of knowing you. Not just of, of the earlier levels of the religion, but the higher stations of religion, being from the arifin, the people who know you. That's what we want to aspire to. And we ask that Allah make that possible for us, fi khair wa lutful afia, with ease. That's Allah wanting to be known. It's not, he's not asking the human being to be known in that instance. He wants... So when we talk about the attributes of Allah, there are attributes of Allah that we take on and there are attributes that we don't take on. So you can try to take on, for example, the attribute of Rahmah. You should not try to take on the attribute of Al-Jabbar, right? The all-compelling one. That's not an attribute for you and me, right? Or keep, or the attribute of Allah having his Kibriya, of being the all-great, of the all-proud. That's not an attribute for the human being to take on. Maybe in very specific small instances, but generally, that's not our attribute. So there are attributes where you, or, or the attribute of samadhiya, where Allah is self-sustaining without any need for food and drink. We take on a small portion of that in Ramadan and we can barely get through the day, 
right? But that's Allah. He doesn't need sleep. He doesn't need, right, atul kursi. He doesn't need food. He doesn't need any of these things. We don't try to take that on. So in the same way, our desire is to know Allah. It's not actually to be known. That's the first thing. That should be where our heart's directed. Now, when it comes to the, the question of what about where the, 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 the greats of the past wanted to make sure this tradition was spread, that was their name was detached from it. So it's not that I want to be known, right? It's that all of the Sahaba, they did not want leadership positions. They didn't want it. What the Prophet said, it's a bad sign if you're desiring a leadership position. That if you want to run, I want to do this, I want to read about the seerah, they would nominate each other. They'd be like, ah, no, 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 you can do that. At the Sahaba that gave fatwa, for example, only all of the companions were really learned, but like eight or ten of them gave fatwa. Now these days, you can go learn for like two, three, four, five, six years, and you're giving fatwa, fatwa, askmufti.com. Like you can just fatwa all the time, right? But Sahaba were very careful, and they didn't want their name to be known. So you don't want to be famous. It's actually seen as something blameworthy to, be, to seek fame. It's seen as a lower desire. But if you're doing the right thing in this religion, and Allah wants to elevate you and elevate the religion, he will elevate you. So for example, Imam al-Haddad, one of the greats of this, of this tradition, one of the great scholars, Imam Abdullah ibn Alawi al-Haddad, he lived in the 16th, 17th century in, in Hadramaut, Yemen. He desired always, he begged Allah for obscurity. He begged Allah for obscurity. He didn't want to be known. But he was just, Allah, Allah made him known. And now his litanies are recited, his adhkari compiled, recited all of the world. His books are widespread. His books are translated in English and Malay, all these languages. He didn't want to be known. At the, at the time, Five, ten people would attend his gatherings. Now millions and millions of people have benefited from his work. He didn't desire to be known. He begged Allah for obscurity. Because he begged Allah for obscurity, Allah wanted him to be known. That's what we want. We don't want to be. And the reason is, is if you imagine a plant, the human being is, is compared to a plant a lot of the times in, um, uh, in the Quran and in our Islamic tradition, in, in the metaphysical tradition. And a plant cannot take root until it is deeply rooted in the soil. And what's going on in the soil is everything is hidden and obscure and unknown. So the human being's spiritual realities cannot take root until you are completely obscure. That you ask Allah, Ya Allah, don't even let me think like I'm anything about myself, let alone other people think something about me. Then you're deep rooted in the soil. Now all of the stuff we talked about starts to benefit you. Right? Because you're actually rooted in something. If you were the whole time, and you have scholars like this, and the Prophet described them, he called them, these are known in our tradition as ulama asu, evil scholars, that they want to learn so that they can be famous. Ooh, bad sign. It's a hadith where those will be the first people that are thrown into the hellfire. The Qaris, the Quran reciters that recited Quran so that people could applaud them, say, mashallah and so they could become famous. And the same thing with the scholars. So that's actually, that hadith in and of itself shows us the detriments of seeking fame. Because you should have sought memorizing the Quran for Allah's pleasure. But you actually did it so that everybody could be like, wow, look at you and, you know, give you this, the, all these nice things and make you, you know, you're well known and you're the most famous person. And now that was your intention. There's a big problem. There's one thing if that was your intention. There's another thing if you did it and Allah just gave all that attention to you. And that's a fitna. That's a big test. Ask anybody who's a person of knowledge and who's in that position. It's a huge test. They don't want that at all because it brings a bunch of issues. Does that make sense? Any other questions or shall we? Okay, alhamdulillah. So stress and anxiety. So it's all of this is very much linked, but uh, if one thing that's really important to understand. So if we, the human condition, Allah talks about in the Quran how he created the base state of the human being. He'll tell you like that we created mankind weak. We created insan weak. Then he also says in one of the surahs of the Quran, he says that we created the human being in a state of anxiety. So it's really important to remember. He literally created you and me in that state, the very base natural state that we come into this world. We're like, crying, we're, like we're in that state of anxiety, right? And that's normal, that's okay. But then Allah tells us how to get into a higher state. And he says in the Quran, in the same surah, right? What is the description of these people who are in the state of anxiety? That when they're afflicted, they complain. When something bad happens, I can't believe this happened to me. There was just so much, oh, today there was so much traffic. And oh my God, I can't believe it. And this guy at work did all this stuff. We just complain, 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 complain. It's so hot today, I can't believe it. Like we're just, 
right? And that's the state. We're in one of the tr the signs that you have this inner anxiety is you're always complaining, as Allah says in the Quran. And then He says, when and when He's given good, He holds back. No, mine, mine, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna give it to anybody. I gotta promote. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna share. Why would I share this wealth? What the masjid needs money? Who cares? The masjid needs fine. It's fine. Right? Just the state of holding back, right? And then He says, illal musallin. He describes the exception to that. He says this is the normal state that most people are in, but you don't want to be a follower, even this age of followers. You want to be somebody who's leading, who's 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 showing people. Okay, no, this is how the Prophet ﷺ did things. He says, "Illa al-musallin," except the people of prayer. So the first category of the people who are not in the state of halua, and this links to everything we just discussed, and halua is anxiety, is the people of prayer. But what are the people of prayer? Anybody? Who are the people of prayer? Is it just like if you prayed five times today, can we be from the Musalleen? Sorry? What was it? Khushua, right? SubhanAllah, right? That, that people of prayer, that Khushua is there, so the prayer is actually having an effect. That you have these traditions of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een that they're praying, and literally, like a wall will collapse in the house. And they're just completely in the prayer. And everybody else runs out of the house. They come back to them. They're like, why didn't you leave the house? Like, why? He's like, I don't, what happened? I don't even, I was, I was completely, I was, in, I was somewhere else. What happened? I don't even know what you're talking about. Or that one of the Sahaba, that they had a bow that came and was, was stuck to their leg. And they said, wait till I enter prayer. Then you can take it out. I'll be, I'll have my um, spiritual anesthesia kicking in. He's just like, then you can take it out. Because I'll be in prayer, I'll be in a different world. So then you can take that out. These are different realities. We have a hard time understanding these realities because of the earlier thing that we were mentioning that we've brought this, made this religion all about the outward. There are inward realities to this religion that we should aspire to. The people of Ma'rifah, of Gnosis, of uh, the, the Arifin, they're in this state. When they're in prayer, when they say, Allahu Akbar, they toss the whole dunya behind their back and then they come into their prayer and there's just them and Allah. They, they're not thinking about, you know, how much traffic is there going to be? This one like for lunch, like all the stuff that crosses at least my mind, right? Like they're not thinking about that. They're in a completely different state. So these are the people then that anxiety is not going to phase them in the same way. The second thing, so that's the first, right? The second is what is the state then that Allah describes of calm people? He describes in the Quran there is there is there is a category of people that are completely calm. He says, "In al awliya Allahi." لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون. That the awliya of Allah, they don't fear, they don't grieve, they don't have this state of what's going on with everything. That's what anxiety is. It's this constant worry because you, you're in control. What did we say in the beginning? Submission. If you are in a state of submission, you won't need to be in control. Then when you're in a state of submission and Allah is controlling, you can attain the state where you're not in a state of worry or anxiety. So then he also describes the people who are calm, Allah bi dikrillahi tatma'in al qulub, as we mentioned, that verily in the dikr of Allah does the heart find rest. So you have this state then of anxiety where we begin, and this state of calmness, which is where we want to attain, the awliya, the wilaya. And dikr, Allah tells us then, is the path to get there. So it's very um, uh, simple in one way, right? That, and I'm going to get back up on this board. That if you and I began in this state of worry and anxiety, and we're trying to stay, attain the state of calmness, tranquility, sakina. Right, we began here, this is the initial state of anxiety. And then Allah says the people who are not in this state of anxiety are the musallin, and the awliya are also in that same category, right? So this is that state of Wilaya. Oh. Okay, so there's a lot up here, so let me just explain. So we were mentioning, we started in this state of anxiety, right? And then Allah says that the people who are not in the state and the people who are calm, right? That the awliya of Allah, the walis, the saints in our tradition, the saints, they're not in this state. They're calm. They're tranquil. And then he says, that dhikr, Brings the heart to rest, and then we also mentioned one of the ways that the heart, need, what one of the ingredients the heart needs is knowledge, 
right? And then Allah also makes it clear that, that his love is essential. So these are the ingredients to get on this path. When you have these ingredients, the problems that we face become, it's, it's, we're able to put them into perspective. Then there's another layer here where there's levels of the nafs. Allah describes in the Quran different levels of the nafs. He describes what's called the nafs al-amara, nafs al-amara bisu, the evil commanding self. That is the first level of the nafs. That is the nafs that all it thinks about is food, relations, power. That's all it cares about. And it gets, if you like say one thing, it'll just lash back out at you. It gets angry. Most of the people in society are in this state. Now the Muslim, the interesting thing is that the success criteria for Muslim is not a master's degree or a PhD or whether you're a senator or a congressman. It's actually whether you've attained this state. This is the ultimate goal of the Muslim. And if you're in any other worldly position but you don't have this goal, we're missing out, right? You go from the nafs al-amara, the evil commanding soul, by doing knowledge, by sorry, by learning, by doing enough dhikr, to what's called the nafs al-lawama. So Allah, this is mentioned, nafs al-amara in Surah Yusuf, and then this is mentioned in la uqsumu bil yawm al-qiyamah wa la uqsumu bil nafs al-lawama, right? Surah Al-Qiyamah. So the nafs al-lawama, the self-blaming soul, this is the nafs that's like, shouldn't have done that. Why did I? Why did I drink that? Or why did I smoke that? Or why did I look at that? You know that that girl. Why did I look at that guy? Like why did I do that? I shouldn't have done. They start to blame yourself. You can be in these stages for years or eternity, your whole life. These stages can exist forever. It's not that it's like a, you know, video game level where it just gets to the next level in a couple of hours. You know? and may I ask Allah for tawfiq inshallah. And then the nafs al mutmainna. That's the awliya, calm, serene soul, right? Surah al Fajr. Ya ayatul nafs al mutmainna. Irji ila rabbika radiyatin mardiyya. That, that, oh, tranquil soul. So the tranquility is the opposite of the anxiety. And Allah in the Quran tells us how to get from this problematic state of anxiety, stress, and worry to this ideal state of tranquility. And this is where happiness lives. This is where all the good things live. Right? These, people, these people are very happy. They're, they're just completely calm, happy people internally. And they've achieved this state through knowledge, Enough dhikr of Allah and love of Allah. Now, the interesting thing is you have to keep working hard. That what you were doing when you were here is not going to work. You've got to add more. You were praying the five prayers here to get to here. Now you got to pray way more. you got to add more adhkar. you got to learn more. Up here, you're talking about a different type of dhikr. You're talking about contemplation, meditate, different types of things, right? So what, what somebody is doing up here is going to be very different than up here. But it's important to know the levels. And then on here, and sorry, I wish I had another color, but I... Sin just brings you down. So you might be up here and then you do enough sins and you can go back down into here. Toba, what does Toba mean? It means to turn, literally. It turns you back around. Toba, constant repentance, right? That, that, that Allah is a tawab, right? The one who's turning back regularly towards him. So Toba will help you turn back around. But the sin, and this is where it's important for us to just identify, right? What are the things that I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing, okay? I just make a list, okay? Eyes. I'm looking at things on Facebook or Instagram or when I'm walking that I shouldn't be looking at. I'm looking at people I shouldn't be looking at. I'm not lowering my gaze. Whatever you're doing, identify. Ears, I'm listening to music that's affecting me negatively. And remember, every time you listen to a rap song that has a lyric about misogynizing women and doing this to this woman and doing this, your heart is literally getting black, black, black. You're, just, you're coloring it. And you're just putting images of those things in your heart. Or shoot this person, shoot that person. All these different images that come. Same thing, then just examine all your limbs. Tongue is the one that most of us, I know I struggle with the most. I backbite this person, say something we shouldn't say. Maybe we lied. Maybe we got angry at someone. We just went off on them. Maybe we would cuss somebody out. But we just, it's, it's very actually, again, clear. We just have to identify. And I didn't list everything I. I missed the eyes, which are very important. But just think through, okay, what am I doing? Am I, am I walking to places that are haram, that I shouldn't be going to? And again, we have to know where we're at. That if you're just starting off on the journey, look, and you're still struggling with certain haram things, it's all good. Don't trip. Don't worry. You can still climb on this path and just slowly, slowly. You cannot get from here to be super welly in one day. It's just not, that's not how it works. So don't expect then yourself or your children or anybody, if you've been studying 20 years and somebody else is like just starting, don't expect them to just jump up and understand everything right away. It's going to be slow and it's going to be methodical. right? And then we just have to work on these things. These are the sins between us and Allah. 
there's another category of sins between us and other people. You let you you cheated somebody, stole something from somebody. You then we have to work on those as well. But those that's the path generally that if we follow this path, the anxiety we start to now build the foundations for how to get rid of this, right? The anxiety and the stress. And as we mentioned earlier, when the heart has these, the heart is now in a state of elation and happiness. And the people up here, depression, anxiety, stress, if they do come, it's again a very different type. And it's not the same type that we are going to, going to, going to experience. And so just never give up or think that this is not possible. No, it is possible. Allah created you for this. He wants khair for you. He wants good for us. He wants this for you. And he wants you and I to do the work to make it happen. All of the inspiration to even do this work, the himma, the help, the motivation, it comes from him. And so the whole thing then, inshallah, is just about turning back to him until we get to this higher state where Jannah is, and then we go back to him, right? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Inshallah, we'll, 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 we'll stop there uh, for Isha. I believe it's Isha Akama. And then if anybody has, I, I have a few more things, but we'll just, uh, after Isha, if anybody has questions, uh, we'll come back for some time for questions. I apologize, we didn't leave time. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala Sayyiduna Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik wa nashadu wa la ilaha 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 also takes a toll on us working on ours. Right, okay, very good question. So the question was, how can we take what we've, what we've discussed and apply it especially in situations for people at home if they're in a void and then they're spiraling and then that negativity creates a difficult situation and circumstance for us it's a really good question and there's uh, I definitely don't have you know a definitive answer there I think a few things that have worked is build a human relationship before anything else right so like these are all principles that will make sense for somebody who is somewhat prioritizing even a portion of their life towards spirituality. If that's not the case, the job of the person who is doing that, it's their job to take these principles and figure out how to make them relatable without mentioning something that might turn the other person off. For example, like sometimes people are just turned off by religion. They're like, ah, they had a bad experience. They don't want to have anything to do with it. So you can't mention that like these are things you need to do according to uh, the Quran or according to the scholar, according to that situation. Because they might not be receptive. You have to figure out how can I get the message across to them in a way that will speak through my actions first. So the first step in that is developing a relationship with that person, right? And obviously, I'm sure you have a relationship in this case, but having a enough of a conversational, communicative relationship where it's like the doors are open. If the doors are closed, then the main thing that we can do and that we should still be doing regularly is making abundant dua for that person that the door opens, right? But if the door is closed, if the door is open, that relationship of just like first validate that like you love them and you're there for them. That's really important. And it's like it doesn't matter how bad it's gotten. You're not, it's like I'm not judging you because you're in this situation. I love you. I'm here for you. And I'm just trying to like figure this out on my own, you know, and I know you are too. So like you kind of let that phase go for a little bit, a little period of time. Then you add on the next phase on top, like, hey, I got your back. Is there anything I can do to help? And when they ask you, what do you think I need to do? Now you start peppering in some of this. It's a process, right? You're okay. Have you thought about this? Like I've noticed that, you know, like, what's going on? Like why, why did you, why are you feeling this way? And then they start to mention, you know, this circumstance happened. This thing happened at work. I broke up with my you know, bro boyfriend or broke up with this, whatever situation. You don't say, oh, don't you know it's haram to have a boyfriend? No, you just listen, listen, okay, okay. It's gonna, you know, now, now the heart is broken. Their heart is broken, so you're not going to be able to, you're not going to mend that re easily. Now you try to figure out, okay, how do I apply some of these principles? Hey, um, one thing that really helps me is like sometimes I just like talk to God and I just like, you know, I know you're not really trying to pray, but I just talk to him and that helps. And they're like, okay, I'll try that. Or like, hey, there's this surah that's, that like I listened to on YouTube the other day, and it really made me feel calm. Oh, sure, can you send it to me? And just very small things, you know, very minor. Like, and the, the knowledge piece, like, oh, I heard a, a lecture on YouTube the other day. Just do it, keep it like five minutes, ten minutes, nothing big, right? Check it out or check out this podcast, and maybe you can listen to it on BART. Like whatever little things are on your way to work, whatever it is, right, that you can do, and then you just – Slow, slow, slow. You, you, you do that, and the, inshallah, the door will open. And then um, really begging Allah. So one of the things that uh, I forgot who mentioned this. One of our teachers mentioned this, though, that 80% of dawah, 
is begging Allah for help for that person in the night, in the middle of the night. 20% is the talking. So the Prophet ﷺ, his da'wah, he used all night crying, Ya Allah, help my ummah, help my ummah, help my ummah. Then he would go and he would call, right? But that is da'wah. It's when you really care so much that you're sacrificing your own sleep and everything to beg Allah for help. And why are we mentioning that time of the night? Because that's the time that's known, right, that Allah says in the Hadith Qudsi that I come down in no anthropomorphic physical manifestation but to, my, to the lower heavens in the last third of the night. And I ask, is there anyone who needs anything that I may grant it? Anybody who, who, who has done something wrong that I may forgive them? So the needs are, are answered. So if you couple that, inshallah, with this, hopefully the process gets started. And then uh, I'm, there's a ton more that could be added to that, I'm sure, that I don't know. I don't know. So I'm, I'd be curious to learn you know, from you all and from, from what you benefit. Is there anybody else who wants to add what's worked for them? Please. Um, so adding to a little bit of what she asked, you know, you answered like, uh, recommending, you know, like this tour is really great, or this lecture is really great, or you know, talking to God and stuff. Um, but what would you? Say, and this is this might be a little bit complicated. Yeah. Um, but whatever you say is best. Um, so what about you know people? You know, shaitan gets in your head sometimes, and it it becomes hard for people to, you know, crack open the Quran or like yeah. listen to a lecture or even you know talk to God, and it it becomes scary for some people, mm -hmm. and they're very rejecting. So in terms of that, like, what would you? Say like, how do we approach people in that situation? Like, how do we help them? Because that's a little bit harder than yeah. you know people that are more accepting. Right, right. That's a really good. That's a really good um, question. So one thing is is that's where the humanity before religiosity comes in. That you showing that person through your character that like it has nothing to do with with this religious. Come maybe that's what's driving you. But for them, you're just there for them as a human being. And you can talk to them. Don't mention the Quran. Don't mention religion. Don't mention thicker. Don't mention any of these things. But show them so much through your character that you're there for them, that you got them. When they're crying and they're down, you pick there to pick them up. When they need a ride somewhere, you're there. When they're down, you bring them their favorite burger. Like whatever they need, you have their back. And that is you applying religion and it's you applying the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu right? And then when the moment is right, you pepper in, and it doesn't have to be religious. You just pepper in a little bit of advice. Like, hey, you know, maybe you're feeling really down because that person hurt you like 10 years ago. Maybe we should go seek some counseling, right? That's all coming, ad-deen nasiha right? The Prophet said that deen, the deen is sincere concern, or nasiha meaning advice. It doesn't matter whether you cloak that advice as, oh, this is a religious principle or not. You, he also said, speak to people where they're at. Don't speak to somebody who will be turned off by religion about religion. You just, whatever principles you can apply, and that's where character comes in. That character, good character and showing people, it's interesting. In the Muslim world, in the Arab world, Islam spread through the miracle of the Quran. The rest of the Muslim world, many parts that did not have the ability to understand the Quran in its revealed language, it spread through the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where people went, these merchants would go, they would have such amazing akhlaq, and people would just think, I want to be like you. So you show them, and they're like, well, something's working for you. What is it? And it might take six months. It might take a while for them to observe this. But like, huh, you're just, something's happening with you. You're applying everything. Your character is improving. And your character is manifesting in a way that's starting to bring light into your life, and it'll slowly bring light into their life without you ever having to mention anything. You'd be surprised how many people have come into this religion and nobody did da'wah to them. They just saw somebody who was so, they were just like, but what did they say to the Prophet They said, you, this, he doesn't have the face of a liar. That's what, 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 one of the statements that was said to him, that he just, that's not the face of a liar. He, what he's doing must be haq, right? And you still have people like that today, that they're just so luminous. So your goal then is to be that light, to be that luminosity in somebody and, and or sorry, in your own self and then help bring it out without mentioning anything. Just be very subtle, diplomatic and figure the situation out. Does that hopefully help? Uh, other questions? And did you, do you have a, okay, okay. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Anybody else have anything? Yes.
Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. The anxiety happens in a house because of this kid feeling very distressed to the parents. What should we do? Uh, should we educate the, you mean, give the knowledge to the parents first or give the knowledge, knowledge to the kids? Or I mean, it happens a lot. It happens with me, actually. I feel very anxiety and distress with my parents back then when I was still in a school age. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not... I try, I, try to, I try my best to look for the those knowledge, but somehow nobody helps me. So what should we do if it happened with our kids? That's a really good question. Okay, That's a good thank question. You. So the question is basically that this anxiety, it kind of trickles down. It could be happening from the parents. It could be happening with the whole household. In general, you have this where if the household is a stressful, anxious one, this, uh, the, the child growing up in that household will have extremely high levels of anxiety and they won't be able to explain it. And sometimes health problems, all these things can result. Um, so one of the things that can help, inshallah, is uh, it depends on who's more receptive. So there are some parents who, again, have zero receptivity to religion. Usually it'll be one parent. And may Allah help us if it's both. Usually it'll be like one parent is receptive and one parent is not that receptive. So whoever is receptive, yes, they need to, be, they need to learn what, what it is that our scholars have taught us, right? What Imam Ghazali was mentioning about, hey, you implementing knowledge and love of Allah and dhikr, not in your life only. It's just you just have to start with yourself. You start with yourself, then you help other people, right? So you start with, okay, how do I fix this situation? Then now I'm, I can help the rest of my family. And you, you, you bring them along with you, right? But if that person and that parent is receptive, then they're the ones who are taught. Sometimes, though, it's impossible to get through to, to, to the parents. So you'll get... No, I don't believe you. I go, oh, that doesn't make sense. This is just how things are. Like, they'll, they'll come up with whatever excuse is possible to not accept that advice. And that's where, again, the subtleties of what we were mentioning. You won't be able to, like, this is a very, like, kind of academic discussion we're having. It's not that simple. Obviously, it's not just like, oh, identify this, this, and this. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go up to the highest levels. It's, it's not like that. You have to think that how do I help this child or this parent, this student, whatever situation they're in, with the problems and the unique problems that they're facing. So you take the principles of what we've been discussing and you say, hey, like, oh, okay, I noticed that, you know, you're really struggling with, um, uh, well, your anxiety is really being triggered by a lot of Facebook and Instagram use. Like, it seems like you're constantly worrying about what other people think. Like, uh, why, why do you feel the need to go into that? You don't mention at all, like, I think your heart has a void and maybe you're feeling, you don't have to mention that because they might not be receptive. Why do you think you're doing that? Is everything okay? Like, why do you always feel like you need to do that? I think that's kind of messing up. And you can show them, maybe they're receptive to academic knowledge. So you show them a study about how Facebook is detrimental to the, your nerve connections and how it's breaking, uh, messing up your brain. I mean, there's all these studies now that are done, how it's addictive. Maybe that's what you do. But your intention the whole time is to just get them off that addiction, get them off that void that they're trying to fill with something else. And with the parents, it can also be done in a similar way if they're not receptive to this kind of religious advice. If they are receptive, then the goal becomes, okay, now you just have to bring it slowly into that household where it might be 20 years that household hasn't heard of this at all. Now it's one person's job, your job or somebody else's job to bring that in. Be like, hey, not like I learned this, but you live it. It has very little to do with learning and a lot to do with living. If you just learned 20% and then you lived all all of it, alhamdulillah, that's much better than learning all of it and not living any of it. When you live it, they start to see the change. And then the amazing thing with light and with goodness is it's very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it spreads quickly, contagious. Conta it's very contagious. People really want to be somebody who has that calmness. And that's why you have all these people, they have right, these self-help books. Everybody wants to be like that, right? So people will see that. And they'll see something, right? And the other thing that's really dangerous to be careful is if somebody's doing religion wrong and then they do all this religious stuff and then they're just like a terrible person, they're always yelling, they're mean, they're aggressive, they're angry, they have problems, and they're corrupt. And then it's like, well, this clearly, something's off here. Like, you know, and then they don't want to go to his religion and then that person messed up religion for the rest. So it gets to a very subtle point. The, the, so in summary, basically, if the parent is receptive, you start with the parent. If they're not receptive at all, you start with one parent who is. Nobody's receptive, you get, you come up with a, a kind of a diplomatic, tactful approach to figure out how do you cultivate this without actually mentioning what it is. By living the principles and having the character to show that this is how we're going to uh, bring about this, this, this specific change. Does that, does that help? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah.
Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And then one point I just wanted to mention, and we were mentioning earlier about what are the goals, and we were, we were saying that you know the goal of life is not to necessarily get a certain degree or to get a certain position and whatnot. That doesn't mean that those things aren't good. Those things are good, right? Like we should want to succeed in all aspects. The Muslim is successful in their deen and in their dunya. So like we should want to aspire to high levels, become very learned people, get positions, get a master's degree, a PhD, whatever it is. But that's not the goal of our life. There's a big difference between like, yeah, I'm doing something because it's going to help me achieve something. And like, this is what I worship. The two are very different. We just have to distinguish. The problem is, is we've gotten to a point where we are focused entirely on that sometimes and we forget the deeper purposes. But that's not to say that you don't have a portion of your time where you are spending like, yes, you want to be successful. You want to be somebody who's able to have the, the, the intelligence to actually understand what you need to do to bring about change, help people, help yourself, whatever it is. But that's not the sole purpose of your existence. You understand the higher purpose is Allah, but Allah will, inshallah, be uh, happy with somebody who's also doing these other things in order to get there. So that's just something I wanted to clarify that did not, we don't want to go to any extremes. The Prophet said, the extremists will perish, the extremists will perish, the extremists will perish. In the hadith, it's, it's mentioned in the Hiyal Lumadeen. So you never want to go to extremes. Balance, Ummat and Wasata, we are a middle nation, a balanced nation, inshallah. So we should always keep that balance in mind. So pardon if I said anything that may have led to any understandings of one way or another. Any any other questions, comments? Okay, inshallah, we'll just end out with the, with the dua and the prayer, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam wa ala Sayyidil Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Allahumma aftah alayna fatuhir a'rifin wa fiqhna tawfiq salihin. Allahumma ya Allah, ya Rahman, ya Rahim. Rabbana taqabal minna innaka anta samiul alim wa tawba alayna innaka anta tawab ar-Rahim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina azab al-Nar. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, the one who owns peace, the one who owns tranquility, Ya Rabbi. We ask that you bring tranquility into our hearts, into the hearts of everybody, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, that into the hearts of everybody who came and who's watching and who's trying to benefit, Ya Allah, and, and who's just in this ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Allah, bring tranquility to our hearts, Ya Allah, and to our people, Ya Allah, bring tranquility in this age, Ya Allah, that is filled with anxiety and stress and difficulty, Ya Allah, and remove our sadnesses and remove our problems. Allahumma ni'audhu bika min hamli wal hazan, wa na'audhu bika min ajli wal kasal, wa na'audhu bika min al jubni wal bukh. Ya Rabbil Alameen, remove our problems, remove our stresses, remove our worries, remove our anxieties, and be gentle with us, and allow us to get on a path, Ya Rabbil Alameen, where we seek you and seek your love, Ya Allah, and try to get closer and closer to you, Ya Allah. And you are the one who loved us, Ya Allah, first, Ya Allah, so let us fulfill that and try, try to love you in whatever way that we can, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, and make our hearts pure and purify our hearts gently, fi khair, wa lutf. And we ask that you reunite us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, in this life and in the next life with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wasallam and resurrect us with him and bring us into Jannah the Firdaus Al-A'la with him and with his blessed companions. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam Wa Sayyidina Muhammad Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Jazakum Allah Khair.